And good morning, colleagues. I got the notification Damien had joined Right Club. So if Damien joins Right Club, we all join Right Club. Good morning, colleagues. 2024 Right Club is upon us. Are you well? Are you fabulous? Are you excited? Uh, thank you all for that. That's fantastic. Uh, um, Dina, good morning. Oh, Dina, you look gorgeous. Good morning. Oh. How are you? Happy New Year's. Happy New Year. The, the new year has been fantastic for you. And the wonderful Jenny's joining us. Hello, Jenny. Hi. It's my first time at Right Club. I know. We are so excited to see you. Good morning and welcome. I mean, we're normally, we're normally sort of like Labradors and excited, but Damien and I, when we get new friends, we're just like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, we're thrilled to see you. So, colleagues, welcome, welcome, welcome. And Vita's in. Can I just check how's the hair going? Where are we on the? Oh, it's up. The hair's the hair's up. I'm doing okay, but my partner is now down with COVID, oh, no. and the leg has just about healed. And I started walking, so now I'm at home, stuck for like another week. Right. <laughs> so, what we've learned is partner down with COVID disaster. Leg getting better. I've been sending good energy to the leg for the last Thank week. Thank you. But we are still in unicorn zone. So that, that's just because it's really hot. That just... I'm uh, confined to the sunroom because he's in the bedroom where I normally work. But the setup's working fine. Can I just raise a question as we're about to go into 29 minutes? Why don't I have a sunroom? Damien, I... <laughs> that's my question for 2024. Why have we not got a sunroom, Damien? I'd love one. <laughs> Trust me, you don't want one, Damien. It is so hot. Oh. <laughs> it is so hot in here. In Queensland, if you're living on the top floor of, of an apartment complex, do not get a sunroom. Okay. I'll bear that. Like, <laughs> if we live in Tasmania, then we will. Colleagues, yeah. <laughs> so thrilled to see you all. So, Jen, what we do, darling, welcome to 2024. I'm so excited. Let's make this a fantastic year. Let's make it a transformative year for writing. Let's write important stuff together as a family. Let's do this. So, Jen, what we do is we now, for 29 minutes, go and write sort of silently but together. So we write, 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 write for 29 minutes, and then we come back together and we check in on everybody to see how how they're going so are you so ready ready to have a go with that jen or oh, she's or oh, she's a thumb person damien she's one of our people this is fantastic so colleagues let's begin 2029 let's make this a bloody brilliant year see you in 29 rock and roll girlfriend come on anvita come on in the sun room oh, that's right.
last minute, colleagues. And colleagues, we are finished. Oh, oh yeah. Jen, we'll get to you in one second. You did really well. It's intense, isn't it? And we'll get to you in a second, gorgeous Jen. Damien, our, our friend in life. I can't remember my life before I met you, Damien. And aren't you famous on the internet? Just putting that out there, Damien. <laughs> it's all lies, I tell you. It's not happening. Now, how are you going? Now, what are you writing on now, mate? So I'm writing chapter six, which is my last discussion chapter of my thesis, um, okay. and then conclusion next. So this is all about the legacy of 2011 to 2021, which is the period I look at in Australian television and kind of technological, sociocultural impacts on queer representations. And so everyone I spoke to kept kind of contextualizing things in how it was impacting the now. And so I'm sort of my final analysis before my conclusion is to sort of talk about what the legacy is and the view of the industry and and how linking that to the kind of policies that are now playing out before I get to my conclusion. Oh, Damien, that's that's stunning. And it's a great example of good policy work where when one does interviews with policy work, te teleological data sets emerge. So mm. we have to talk about the past, but through the lens of the present. So, and I mean, our wonderful Susan, both our Susans actually, but Susan L is handling that incredibly well about the positioning of the lens when we come to reassess the movement and, you know, whether we have this progressivist narrative and does that reify the data set, Damien? Mm. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, like lots change. And so like the themes that I look at in this chapter play out a lot in my the rest of my thesis, but it's really around the diversity of stories appearing on screen, the role of talent development in the industry, and then the role that policy plays in both of those things. And all three of those topics are really playing out now because our industry is kind of bombarded with, you know, economic crisis in the words of John T. Caldwell in the ways that competition is increasing and it's making it harder to break the industry. And it's also, we're getting a greater diversity of stories, but actually, are we getting a greater diversity of stories? Like, are they the right stories? Are they pushing the boundaries in new ways or are they sort of rehashing things that we've seen a lot of already? Um, there were some very funny discussions around how far you can push representations of gay men and how dirty they can get. <laughs> Uh, which this I won't repeat here, and I'm not sure how I can repeat them in my thesis. <laughs> look, Damien, look, it's an interesting conversation. I've been thinking about that a lot because I'm doing a couple of things on the claustro. I'm, this is my claustropolitan year, so I'm doing a lot of work on that. And, of course, the language is pretty saucy, and wonderful Susan L talked about this last week, and I've been thinking about that all week. But, Damien, I wonder if there is a research integrity matter here whereby we have a responsibility to present our respondents as they express themselves to us. And that's... Mm, the, yeah. That's it's what... Certainly, I, I embrace some of the swearing. People who work in TV swear a lot, it turns out. Uh, <laughs> and so I embrace a lot of that. And, and I think part of it is that they talk about the history of how representation was repressed and part of what they want to do is push against that. And there's that question of like commercial versus art house. And, you know, unless it's art house for art house sake, commerciality does 
temper a lot of what they might want to show when they go to a medium like television. And, Damien, I'll I'll just finish off. We're going to go straight to Susan L and then our wonderful Susan M. But, Damien, the word I've been thinking about a lot this week is bourgeoisification. Yeah. And I wonder how much we want our universities bourgeoisified so they're nice and comfortable spaces and places for nice middle-class people to live. Oh, it's a good point. Certainly. That's not the purpose of a university. Yeah. And yeah. certainly my experience of this community that I've been in since I was a teenager is not a tame one. It's not a tame place. and it, it The mainstream view of us is often very tame. And that's across the whole spectrum of LGBTQI+. So it's interesting to sort of push back against that and say, oh, this is how TV shows us, but it's not necessarily us. Yeah. And I wonder if we live in tame times anymore, Damien. <laughs> we certainly do. <laughs> um, you're the best. But again, I'm just raising this because I'm raising it in my own because I've obviously I'm in a sort of book 21 or 22 and I've I've self-censored myself and most importantly self-censored historical sources through my career and in 2024 we have to ponder particularly after Susan L and Susan M's inspiration on me whether we do that anymore and that's why I'm, I don't want to tell you what to think but I wonder if the if your respondents have used that language have we got a right to edit it mm. oh, for, absolutely. for bourgeois examiners yeah, no, it's a good point. Just just ponder it. As look, we go to the expert in this, the person that started this conversation, the legendary Susan L, and we'll go to Susan M straight after, but Susan, good, good evening from New York City. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. Good evening to everybody. Yeah, I spent the time working on the abstract for this article that I, we talked, that I mentioned last week. Um, it's 175 words, and I'm trying to cut it down, you know, to around 100 or so. Yes. Um, yeah, but uh, in, in cutting it down, you, you know, just cutting it down to 100 words, it's really hard because, you know, I put so much of myself into the article um, that I don't want, you, you know how you don't want to give up on any of your words because they're like your babies. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but then I tell myself, okay, this is just the abstract. This isn't the article. Yeah. And <laughs> so don't worry about it. No, but, but also worry about it passionately, Susan, because we want tens of thousands of people to read it. So the thing about the abstract is it's got to be this incisive, sharp hook. It's got to go oof, and pull someone into your fabulousness. So that's why the abstracts are so hard to write. Yeah, it, it's sharp. And then it also nowadays, because of the, the digital era, it has to have keywords in it. Yeah. The right, the right keywords. Well said, absolutely right. And these days, when in doubt, put in COVID. Put in <laughs> I know you can't, but Damien can. Damien, put in COVID as a keyword somewhere. We all need oh, to. It's not up enough. <laughs> so, Susan, you, you are the best, Susan L. We'll go straight to Susan M. Susan, you're the best, and I really thank you for the honesty and the conversations you're having, and it is changing our worldview, my darling. So I thank you every night. You come and join us from New York City on Thursday night. You matter, darling. So I thank you. Well, I thank you. I thank everyone here too. You're helping me. Oh, you're amazing. And look, we'll go to the Queen herself, Susan M. Wow, you've had a big week online, Susan. How famous are you, Susan M? Talk to me from Jamaica. I didn't know I was famous. Um, hi, everybody. I am from Jamaica and I live in Jamaica. Yeah, so I I uh I applied to this program for climate change. So I got in um, and it's due, something is due tomorrow. So we, we had our first meeting. Sorry, let me give you the context. The context is I teach in computing. I have done no treaty climate change ever. And I'm now in a program where I'm one of eight scholars that was doing some training on climate change. Anyway, so as part of this training that we're in over nine months, the first assignment is to write a, a couple of the climate aid issues in your country and to note some ethics issues. So I, I've been working on it a few weeks ago, but it's due tomorrow, so I was just trying to finish it up. So, um, and I'd written this long thing, and then when I, before I got the, the assignment in writing, and I realized, oh, right, a couple percent. So I was having the same problem as Susan um, L, because I, I, I realized I said, write, 
one or two examples and like a sentence. And he gave an example of like, well, I had to like be trying to compress. Uh, but I, I think I've asked a really big question, you know, like let's go to the ethics questions. This won't take long. I have some context, the examples, I won't give you that. The questions at the moment are, what are ethical ways to persuade university students to become involved in climate action, especially in the context of a mandatory community service program mm -hmm. to help women at risk of being adversely affected by climate change? Sorry for such a long question, but hey, that's what's on my mind. And then the other question is, do academic staff have an ethical responsibility to provide leadership in a community service project designed for climate change and, and health? So I was working on that and, and the example and trying to put it into context and all of that. Well, Susan, so that's I, what I'm working on right now. Well, can I? If we, can we all just do this for Susan? Can we just go? I, I I think they may be absolutely outstanding research questions, and for all our friends uh, that watch this uh, asynchronously, so later, Susan, they are the archetypes of great research questions, and they're really hard to do. Research questions. I know I have so many students in my office, Susan, that come in and say, oh, look, I just can't write the research questions. The first thing I have to say is it's really hard, really hard to write research oh, questions. And what you've just okay. done there, unbelievable. I was working on it from before, you know. This is not my first version. <laughs> and I know it's not your first go at the circus. I know that, Susan. Um, but can I say okay. it's, it's still breathtaking. And, look, I will go straight to Doug. Hashtag no pressure, Doug, because Doug is is – about to start his thesis on Monday, colleagues at CDU, on climate change, Susan. So he's going to learn a great deal from you. So, Doug, no pressure. No, Susan's put no pressure on you at all. No, no, not at all. No, no. It's, yeah, it's in the bag. <laughs> so, 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 mate, what, what were you writing on today just to get yourself oriented in the vibe, darling? Well, I first started on an article, which um, I got a, a reply back from Katie from Emerald. I know. And she wanted to know if I could do an article by end of July, because um they have cut for the the particular uh, journal they're not having author processing charges, they suspended them for that till July, so I just gotta get off my bottom and do that. But do then that. I thought I'll I'll go and do the confirmation of candidate um document instead, but uh, I've I might just work on an article um, and see it where it goes. If if I if I could get it going, if if not, bugger it. Yeah, bugger it. Can I say, and that's a technical phrase, colleagues. Doug, can yeah. I tell you, mate? When something like that comes up, my ninety-three-year-old mother would say, "Break their bloody legs." And what she means by that, because she's classy like me, is when people give you an offer like that, you grab them and you stop them leaving the building. You break their legs. Okay, so, darling, the answer is yes to that. And, Sweetie, so you're happy to share the name of the journal? Because oh, I'll just, um, it's urbanisation and, oh, where is it? Urbanisation, so it's Emerald Sustainability and Society. Say that again because I spoke over you because I got a big gob, Doug. Urbanisation, Sustainability and Society. And they're currently waiving APCs on any article submitted before July this year. And uh, and she's also um, copied me into law, Emerald's editor, Laura, regarding further questions. Gee, you're popular. Right, so, Doug, yeah, we're, we're going to do that. And, colleagues, when that happens, and can I recommend them? Well, I've published books with them how many times, Doug? Two or three times. I've found them very strong. So if you're working in that area, that's something to go for. Dougster, legendary, well done. Well done, Doug. And he hasn't started yet, Jen, and he started writing his confirmation of cancer too. So, Jen, how, how did you go? Just, again, just anything you'd like to share with us in your comfort zone is is fabulous. Hi everyone, thanks for welcoming me so much. Yeah, my name is Jen. Uh, I'm in the CDU Brisbane office and so I'm in the faculty of, well, we used to be the College of Nursing and Midwifery. I guess now we're the Faculty of Health. Yeah. Uh, so what, and um, I'm in the third and final year of my PhD and I'm a program evaluator. My thesis is on around looking at what, I can do as a researcher to improve the utility and usefulness of program evaluation for our community partners, which are Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Services. 
Ooh, that's yeah. the context. So today I was um, rewriting. I I wrote a I drafted a publication a couple of months ago, and um, you know I I did I made a mistake. So I had already written the evaluation reports for these two programs, and everybody was happy with those. And then now you know turning them into publications. So some of our my primary supervisor raves all the time about one particular woman who works in our team a researcher she always is like oh you know bloody blah, blah look at how she writes oh she's the best writer oh well if you could write it like she doesn't matter who she's talking to she always talks up that person's writing so I grabbed that person's thesis and a bunch of their journal articles and I really tried to analyze how they write made a bunch of notes for myself and then I wrote this paper and tried to reflect all of those things and handed it in a few months ago for feedback before Christmas to my supervisors and um, they were so concerned they immediately they obviously had been talking to each other they were so concerned that instead of waiting two days for my next supervision they got me um, you know on the screen and said, basically, it's really boring. Like, oh, we've read your paper and, um, you know, yes, it answers the question. They said it really nicely, but basically they said, it's really boring. And we wonder really what's happened to your writing because all the things that you usually do, the quotes, the women's stories threaded throughout the work, all of that's gone. And uh, we wonder if you could put all that back in. So I had to go away and laugh to myself and think, that's so funny because you always rave about this woman's writing. <laughs> she never includes the women's words or quotes or whatever. So lesson learned for me, just write the way I write. So, so, so I've gone back to that paper, just writing it the way I be, write. Be you. Now, Jen, I don't know if you, when you watch this on record, you can see the faces of the people in this group, right? We are with you, darling. And Jen, I'm getting to the Brisbane office shortly, so I'll see you there. But everybody's face, everyone is with you now, darling, Jen. And the, the worst thing that writing can be is derivative and attempting to replicate other humans. Good writing is a big, broad church, Jen. It has multiple consequences. And what great writing does is you become your best self, my love. And it's it's you. And that's mean you don't read other people and learn and work out what's writing and what's not. But it's becoming the star of your own life, darling. And I can't, if it helps you, Jen, remember, I'm very, very old, but I'm also very, very experienced. And when I went through my degrees, my supervisors, they hated how I wrote. They hated my writing. It's like, oh, why don't, you know, you, it's about, we talk about with Damien Bourgeification, it's like, you write like a pro, Tara, you write like you live on the streets, right? Okay, so, and I got this day after day after day, and then, you know, went to examination and it got the highest possible marks it could get, right? So, Jen, part of writing is confidence, sitting in your power, and believing that you can do it. So, Jen, you can do it. Are you all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. My chief concern was that they were thinking that I'd cheated because they've seen a lot of my writing. I'm a senior research fellow at CDU, you know, my primary supervisor I've known and worked with for more than 25 years. So I, that was my worry. And when I finished or whatever, I should ask them, but that was my worry. It was like it kind of was so different to how I usually write, but they probably thought I cheated. So anyway. No, yeah. no, Jen, you haven't. Trust me, as the person who runs academic integrity and research integrity at the university, you know the dean that does that. She likes you a lot. Um, people can't just randomly go, you you plagiarist, you. You can't do that, right? It's not like herpes. You got herpes. It's not like that. There's a whole process and policies and things that occur. So don't you worry at all. But can I say, if you're ever worried about that, remember CDU, every student has access to Authenticate. It is yours to use whenever you feel like it, okay? You are precious, Jen. I need to go immediately to Gay because Gay, of course, just so you know, Jen, Gay is not only a completed PhD student but a professional editor. So we use Gay's expertise a lot. Gay, talk to us and then let us know, know how you've gone, Gay. Darling, go. 
Jen, I just wanted to reiterate what Tara said. You have to write like you. Trying to write like somebody else doesn't work. So um, I'm, I'm sure you got some information when you were studying that other person's work. Use it to um, create your own voice rather than trying to reproduce somebody else's. Beautifully said. I hope that helps. Can I tell you about my what I was doing, please? I'm desperate to hear about you, Gay. I always am. I'm tell me, girlfriend. Tell me. Okay. So um I'm looking at my soldiers again. Yes. Um finding so many tr trying to find a particular unit is incredibly difficult because everything was so fluid and so messed up. Anyway, what I have discovered in my cohort of 18 soldiers who started off as citizen military forces and then were um, compul compulsorily um, called up to full-time duty, 50% of those people, no, 50, a little bit over 50% of those people found every single way they could possibly find to get out of the forces within a month. There it is. There it is. So um, gunshot wound to the foot. Oh, don't try that at home, Colin. All of a sudden, I'm a reserved occupation. All of a sudden, um, I'm sick and I'm malingering in hospital. They are trying to do everything they can do to get out of military service because they can see this is really serious stuff. They could get killed. And some of them were even discharged as not mentally fit to serve and i'm thinking these poor guys they are laborers and farmers and they're pulled into this thing and they just can't cope it's so sad for them and yet i'd have two people in my cohort who went full bore went and, and uh fought in the um the horrible fighting in buna and gona and kokoda and Milne Bay and survived and uh it's just devastating all around see see that data set that you've configured there and that's what i've talked about with damien and both of our susans this morning is that gay that getting that data set out on its own terms in its own way is transformative of the ideology of australianness and militarism yeah. so i just thought doug did you want to speak to wonderful gay on that go brother um this is my me Reminds me of what happened in Russia last year with Putin wanting to um, pull up all, all able-bodied men and all that. I think the highest uh, Google search was how to break an arm. Yeah. Because well, they wanted to know, well, if you have a broken arm, you can't enlist or, or be drafted. So um, people were really looking into how to get out of it if they couldn't leave the country. And that's actually safer than than shooting yourself in the foot because you, yes. can, you can get executed for shooting yourself in the foot. So breaking an yeah. arm yeah, sounds good. Yeah, do it. And who knew we'd be having this conversation this morning? Damien, this is knowledge to bring forward in our lives, can I say? I've learned a great deal today, Damien. I'm about to go to Bidflan Vita. I'm just going to do a wave at Professor Jamie Quinton. As most of you know, Jamie Jamie returned to Otoro, New Zealand. He's in Auckland Airport. Hello, Jamie. I love you, darling. Love you to see you, beautiful. Um, and, and Vita, who's joining us from the sunroom, Jamie. How posh is <laughs> Vita? Now, what were you writing on, oh, posh queen of the universe? I have, uh, so my... Not, not not really my 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 resolution, but my aim for twenty twenty five is to definitely eat the frog every morning, which is you know tackle my most like the thing that I've been putting off for the longest time. So that and that was uh, outlining and making notes for my discussion chapter, and I have done that. I've got four pages worth of dot points, like segregated into sections. So I'm ready to start writing that out later today, starting tomorrow. And, and Vita, that's it, darling. Once you've got to that point where it's 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 what your old dean calls task management, when you've got the task management in place, you assign the tasks to a time, time management to the task, and you finish it very quickly from there, my darling. Yeah, it, it's actually, it's really nice to be at this point because I think, and I have to say, Tara, I loved your Outrider, your latest Outrider of rebooting your PhD. 
I was in that state six months ago when I first started coming to, um, you know, Wright Club and to Dean's office hours. And it was fantastic because those were exactly the steps that I took to reboot it because I was struggling. And it's it's really nice. Six, seven months later, we're sitting here writing up my discussion, going to finish my final analysis. And it, it's great. So yeah. Oh, and Vida, you're, you're so spectacular. And yeah, it's weird that rebooting paradigm has moved people, particularly, can I say, outstanding, experienced women who have suffered a lot and gone, I'm out. Those women that have suffered a lot, when they go through the rebooting protocol, they see it and they win. Every it was fantastic. I just made notes and it just was so reminiscent of every step that I took to get myself out of it. And Jen, who's here, was witness to me almost like losing it in June. Because <laughs> oh, Jen and I are in the same research center, we're in I the know. same office. I know. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. But, but Jen is not in the sunroom with you, clearly. Oh, no, I don't think anybody should be in the sunroom with me. It is so hot, but it's the only other place that we have a uh, dining table. My uh, our dining table is set up over here, so I have to sit over here. To walk. I still so I think it, I still think it's glamorous. I still think Damien and I that's an <laughs> goal for us. Well, but, Tara, when you visit Brisbane, I can you can come home and visit my son room. I will. We'll have dinner one night. I'll get a selfie room. and and make make Damien squirm. I'm in this. <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. Um, you have a deal. I think we've got time for two more people. And of course, we'll go with our two gorgeous, glamorous humans. We'll go to the wonderful Jane and finish with the finisher. But Jane is precious. She we love it when Jane is with us. She teaches on Friday morning normally. So she's joined us here. Uh Jane, light of our lives. Darling, what were you writing on, beautiful girl? Thank you so much. And I was writing that. Thank you for bringing me back to Australia because now I can. I open my uh, supervisor comment and um, they want to know more about my 20 years of experience in Vietnam as a researcher. So that's why I was <laughs> writing about my life as a non-swimmer in the river. But then I found an article that uh, I think that's very relevant to all international students here. Um, it's the experience of international uh, PhD students and they describe their life as uh, throwing into the water, uh, throw into the sea, uh, learn from the swimmer, and then surf in the sea. So I think that's the cosmos answer for, for my call. So again, we are in the waterscape and have more reason to write that in my way. Uh, thank you, Jan and Gay and everyone. So I will keep uh, writing differently. And how about that, Jen? R write in your way. Uh, Jane does this incredible work with water, with river, with flow, and she's changed how most of us think about the world as we walk through the world on a daily basis, Jen. So Jane changes our lives. She's an amazing human being. We love you, Jane. Every success, my gorgeous one. And we'll finish with the finisher, the woman who is looking like she's straight out of a salon this morning. Um, Dina, darling one, we're all absolutely with you and hanging on to every bit of our body to hear about Max is with you. Look at Max is going, I want to go. So Dina, Dina, where are we at, mate? Where are we at? Come on, bring it. Um, firstly, happy, happy birthday, Tara. Um, I know it it was it's it was your birthday because um I listened to one of the outrider. And um so um I didn't have much to write because uh, my mother-in-law had to be admitted to a hospital again but um i'm at the end of the conclusion and um uh i said that i had a mental block uh, a writer's block and then i came to one of your conclusion blogs and um there's a thing when you said about why does this research matter so i contemplated a lot on that um on that question. Uh, for me, uh, of course, the PhD is for um, advancement of the knowledge. That's why we are all doing the PhD. But when I reflect to my own motivation and why I started this to begin with, it's quite a bit personal because um, I know um, I work with the people um, who are responding to the, the disaster and I know how the lack of attention that they get, although um, their their job compromise uh, their life so often. So 
I wonder, Tara, when I write the final thoughts, why does this research matter? Is it okay for me to put those personal value inside? Because as you know, um, in my journey of doing this PhD, uh, like Jen too, I was also heavily criticized on my writing style. And because I'm not from an academic background, I'm more of the practitioner who wants to advance my career. That's why also I wanted to do the PhD. Um, I can't like be, uh, be very um, advanced on this knowledge issue, this altruistic purpose of um, doing a PhD because we want a better world. But for me uh, personally, it's because I want to put the stories of these people that are unheard of. And uh, when I, um, I, I'm planning to uh, present this to the Ministry of Social Affairs who are um, establishing the program for um, this KSB. And this is what I want to do. I want to put the KSB as the, as the highlight. Like when I did, did my literature review, um, I, uh, we found out that a lot of research have been done to assess how they work, but there are there are no research yet to understand how they feel, what they want from this program, and how do they, uh, how do they, what do you call it, keep their commitment, keep their passion to keep on going. So I wanted to put that as a center of why it matters for me and why it should matter for the policymaker. So, but again, it's very practical and it's very <laughs> not academic. Um, so, so, <laughs> so, Dina, what you mm -hmm. just expressed in the last two minutes, transcribe that and your writer's block is over. That's your conclusion. The second thing I need to say to you is no research exists without the researcher. Whether you're looking at experimental physics or you're looking at the high humanities, you can never park the researcher from the research. If you do that, you are not being research. You're not demonstrating research integrity. You're not being honest. So who you are and the story of your research, they combine. And in your conclusion, part of the significance is you demonstrating that connection. And sweetheart, the final point I'd say to you is never feel the pressure around you that discredits applied research. Too often in our universities, applied research is used as a pejorative phrase. It's not. It's a oh, look at Max. Max is with you, girlfriend. Look at Max. Come on. Um, applied research is precious. It's important. It's different. It's defiant. And it's like a dart that you throw into society and it is transformative for society. So never say, oh, well, look, it's not experimental and it's not high theory. The applied research matters and your commitment as a researcher to that applied research matters. And the final point I'll say to you is your examiners will lose their mind when they read that conclusion. They Look at Jane. They will lose their mind, darling. So you write it. You write it with the passion and the energy and the positionality that you have, and you will move through with flying colours, Dina. Be honest and robust. If you didn't talk about those things, then you're not demonstrating research integrity. Have I convinced you? Of course. You just always, Tara. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm just dialogue, really. Colleagues, can I thank, thanks, Doug. Yeah, Doug's on here. She really is. She really is. Colleagues, can I thank you so much for your time? Max, thank you for your energy and your enthusiasm. The last two hours, Max has been like the cheerleader of the world. Thank you for joining us, colleagues. See you all next week. Travel well, Professor Clinton. See you on the other side. And Vita, enjoy the sunroom. Bye. <laughs>